So we're going to start with uh, Valerie Jean Blakely. Uh, you can read the bios on there, but Valerie Jean uh, has been one of the key organizers of the Poor People's Campaign here in Michigan. Those of you that might have been up at the Capitol last summer when all the activity was going on with the, the uh, Reverend Barber's uh, campaign for New Moral America, she was, she was there leading the troops all the way through a day after day after day after day. Uh, an inspiring voice, she's got quite a personal story too. Following her will be Leah Daiga, who is an MSU student, uh, very involved with Sunrise. Matter of fact, she was the MC yesterday at the state capitol for the climate strike. <laughs> following, following her will be Johanna Bosowa, who works with the Democracy Collaborative. Most of you don't know the Democracy Collaborative, but you should look at it. They've been doing great work for a long time. She's doing some really incredibly interesting things uh, in real, true, deep community development. She's gonna explain some of that. And last, but certainly not least by a long shot, is Lindsay Kaskarian, who I've been following for many years. She's really quite young. Uh, uh, so the fact that, I mean, she must have started this when she was 11, sort of like Greta, uh, uh, with the National Priorities Project, who's been really helping us who are fighting against war and injustice look at how we could change those priorities. What would a, uh, a billion dollars of uh, money thrown at the Pentagon look like if we transferred it to other places? They're gonna share a lot with you over the next 40 minutes and we'll have some Q&A. And with that, I'm turning it over to Valerie. Thank you very much. It's a real honor to be in this space. Um, we were just talking about how important this conversation is to be having um, the day after the climate strike and while the UAW is striking and there it seems to be movement happening all over the planet um, to save it and make it better. So this is a really important conversation to have and I'm really honored to be here. And I look out and I see a couple people that came to our actions um, and dear friends of the Poor People's Campaign here in Michigan. It's good to see you. Um, so the Poor People's Campaign, our main goal is uniting millions and millions of people to uh, fight against systematic racism, poverty, the war economy, ecological devastation, and the nation's distorted, dis I'm sorry, <laughs> distorted morality. Um, we had 40 days of actions here in Lansing and one in Detroit, and we had a mass action last year in D.C., and that was just the beginning of kind of the things that um, uh, that we were, it was the beginning of a movement where we were gonna gather that millions of people. So um, we believe firmly and strongly that nobody should be poor in, um, or without water or housing or food in the richest, na richest nation on the planet. Um, we believe that housing and water and food, they're all uh, education, they're all human rights, and we deserve them. Everybody has a right to live. In 2008 to, through 2014, law enforcement in Michigan received $58.6 million in military grade equipment. And, and with that equipment, right, they use that, that equipment on us to squash our voices. Here in, De or in Detroit, where I live, where mass water shutoffs were happening, I live on a block where all three blocks were shut off all at one time. We gathered with nurses, women and children, thousands in the street and shut down downtown Detroit because of it. They used that military equipment and that money that they got to squash our voices, use the LRAD on us, which is a long range acoustical device so this, there's no doubt that being poor, you know, um, brings you into uh, bad situations with the police and when, when all you're doing is raising your voice. Um, and they dispersed those, uh, they used military weaponry on women and children and nurses in the street and they dispersed all of us, but we didn't stop there. That's what it looks like to be poor in America. So in 2015, Michigan spent $2.9 billion on defense and $1.8 billion on defense contracts, and that grows every year. While 100, 188,000 million vets sit on incomes below $35,000 a year, they sit in complete poverty. So that war that they went and fought and all that money that was spent doesn't come home with them. 
It, they, they come back very broken and living in poverty. They spend that money killing black and brown people all over the world, devastating their land, soil, and water when it could go into social programs, social programs that could help all of us. There's no reason for Detroit not to have clean water in their schools, for the children not to be able to wash their hands in their schools. The water is shut off in Detroit, but we're spending all of that money, all of that money to kill black and brown people all over the world. It's immoral, it's wrong. Thank you. It could go to healthcare, it could go to affordable, clean water for every Michigander. It could go to education and it could go to housing. There's no reason for it to be, there's no reason for it to be being spent the way that it is. We have solutions though. With the Poor People's Campaign, we work very, very hard. The whole campaign works very, very hard on solutions and being right and doing the actual studying, which you're gonna find out once uh, we move down the panel. But we, want, we put out an audit and a budget. If you go to the Poor People's Campaign website, poorpeoplescampaign.org, you can download the audit and you can download the budget and you can see it's plain, all the solutions are in there. Um, and then hopefully you'll share it with everyone over and over again. These solutions have to challenge the narrative. They have to be at the forefront of our every conversation, every political conversation, every community conversation. We need to be holding these meetings in our communities and talking about these solutions so there's never anybody that can say, oh, you know, we can't afford that or we can't do that. Well, actually we can. We have abundance in this country. We just don't, we have a distorted moral narrative and we don't use it right. Um, so we've got to come together and educate people. We need to build power and register people to vote. Create global networks, global networks. Get out, find people you don't know, meet them, invite them over, and know them. It's the only way that we can actually create a worldwide movement where we're challenging capitalism and ending poverty. Thank you. It's important to organize actions in, in your community so that as we're voting and we're putting in politicians that we think are gonna do okay, we're pushing their hand. We can't, they're not gonna do what we want unless we are in the streets and we're pushing them to do what, we, what our demands, what we need, making sure that they know that we're, gonna, we're not asking anymore. Everybody has a right to live. Everybody has a right to water. Everybody has a right to housing. Everybody has a right to education. Immediate actions you can take, right? Go to the Poor People's Campaign website, sign up, so that you can get the information. We, um, here in Michigan, we have a very uh, active Michigan Coordinating Committee, so if you go to the Michigan Poor People's Campaign Facebook site, and um, you can go, you'll, you'll get notifications if we make an event or anything like that, and then you can show up and um, stand with uh, other people with the same concerns that you have. Um, there's a mass meeting, we're throwing a mass meeting April 3rd in Flint, um, where we're expecting thousands of people to show up. Reverend Barber and Reverend Liz Theo Harris, the co-founders of the Poor People's Campaign, are going to be there. We're going to be registering people to vote, but we're also going to be educating people how to get in the street and make sure that that vote counts. Um, June 20th, uh, 2020, millions in the street in D.C. Millions in the street in D.C. We're going to be um, we're going to be gathering buses. We're gonna be organizing lots of buses coming out of Michigan. So please keep in contact with us, the Michigan Poor People's Campaign, so that you can support that and you can get on the bus and go to DC and we can demand that, we, that they talk about poverty and ways to end poverty. Thank you. Uh, my name is Leah. I am from the Sunrise Movement. I also do a lot of independent work, um, a lot of stuff at MSU, and thank you guys for having me today. Um, not all, it's not all the time that a young person gets to come speak at something like this, so I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I guess I just want to start with the, in the, in the Sunrise way, uh, start with a personal narrative um, about how I learned about PFAS. Um, so if any of you guys follow, like, the lead. mic closer to Yes, sorry. Um, so if any of you guys follow like uh, 
clean water and that kind of stuff, PFAS is uh, a toxin in the water that is very hard to remove. It doesn't come out. It's sourced from um, the production of things like Teflon. Uh, it's, it's bad. Um, so uh, there's this PFAS action response team, and they were pretty much came to the people of Pickney, which is kind of close to here, anyone from around here. Um, and they sat everyone down and I wanted to learn more, so I attended myself. And Alyssa Slotkin and the uh, PFAS Action Response Team pretty much told the people of Pinkney, um, yes, your water has PFAS, uh, no, we don't know what to do with it, uh, do about it, uh, and that was the meeting. And towards the end, uh, they were like, do you have any questions? And they were like, well, it, does my water have it? Does my well have it? How do, how do I get my well tested? And they were saying, well, we don't have funding to test everyone's well. And you're gonna sit here and tell these people your water is dangerous, but we can't do anything about it. And there were people saying, oh, how much does it cost? I'll pay for it. Can I get my own well tested with my own money? And they were pretty much being like, well, you can talk to us afterwards. So this is just another instance of how we're seeing daily that um, our communities have infrastructure that is outdated. Our Eco, our ecosystem is constantly being harmed by how our economy is run, and we um, pretty much believe that, or it's been the dogma that capitalism will eventually shake itself out and that we'll have distribution of resources in a logical way. It'll be a great, and we've seen time and time again that this doesn't work. Um, so instead, we're spending all of our money on trying to control the people who don't stand for this um, and trying to grab more or more resources like fossil fuels when we see increasingly that this is, you know, it's some kind of addiction, I guess. So bringing it back around to the Green New Deal, uh, we want to see more investments in both national and local initiatives to rewild our economy and understand that, you know, our infrastructure is not set up in a sustainable way. Flint is a great example. Their, all of their pipelines should be removed and reset in. And how many other, how many other counties do we have that are like this? You know, there's PFAS in Pinckney, there's PFAS in, um, Will, there's Williamston's, Grand Ledge, uh, Grand Haven, Muskegon. It's all over the place. Yeah. And all over Michigan. And. Uh, Jeff talked earlier about how we need to recycle our materials and how this is a great thing, um, but if you follow recycling at all, I work at the MSU Recycling Center, America doesn't have the infrastructure to deal with our waste. And so rather that means do we invest more in managing our waste? We know that landfills are poisoning our land, they're poisoning our water, so why do we continue to put it there? We know that our wastewater treatment facilities aren't efficient at treating our water that we're putting poisonous water back into our rivers. It runs through this whole system and it's not clean. Pretty much I'm calling for a whole re-innovation of American infrastructure in a way that is actually sustainable and viable for our future. I mean, it's what are we gonna prioritize? This imperialism dogma where the rich get richer or are we gonna put our people first and our planet first? It, that, that's what I got. Hi all, um, my name is Johanna. I'm with the Democracy Collaborative where I work primarily on <coughs> climate and energy. Um, the Democracy Collaborative is an organization that works on building the democratic economy um, so that we can redistribute the wealth that is so um, concentrated with the 1%. So we work to say, hey, ownership matters. Ownership is how we're going to redistribute power, and we need to ensure that this is an economy that isn't built off of the black, um, backs of black and brown communities, but it's one that's for them and that they're in charge. Um, and so we, um, I work a lot on climate, and today I wanted to talk a little bit about the power um, of you know, defunding the military and putting it into things that build the democratic economy. Um, uh, and I, damn, do I have a lot of plans for it. <laughs> um, my first one is we've got to end the fossil fuel era. And uh, right now the United States is slated to become a net exporter of fossil fuels. Um, that's a, that will send us into climate chaos. Um, it puts us 
way above 1.5 degrees, which is barely a livable planet. It puts us, uh, you know, to three, four, five degrees if we don't rein this in. And um, when we're talking about military, Valerie put it so well that um, the people who are dealing with this fossil fuel infrastructure are dealing with militarism in the United States. And that is often in indigenous and black uh, communities who are uh, feeling the brunt of this infrastructure. If we look to places like the Dakota Access Pipeline um, and Line 3 uh, in Minnesota, these places have been militarized. Um, and so for me, the way that we could actually start to take, um, take that on uh, in terms of funding is actually have um, a buyout of these fossil fuel infrastructure sites and shut them down and put us in charge of that transition, that just transition for workers and communities that are there that the corporations just aren't going to give. You know, we need, um, because corporations, what they are going to do when it comes down to it, first they're going to uh, get as much oil out of the soil as they can, and then once it comes to it and we say, hey, you know, we're going to implement the regulation, they're, they're gonna go, hey, well, now we're bankrupt. And we're already seeing this happen in um, the coal, in coal country. We just had strikers, um, coal workers striking because, uh, you know, they're, uh, they were losing their pensions. And that's because the coal companies went, went bankrupt. And that means that they get to get rid of pensions. They get to get rid of, you know, the, their commitments to things like health care. And um, while well, they get to walk away with often bonuses as the, um, as the, corporate leaders there. And so um, in a situation in which we could have um, a, a government buyout of these, um, this fossil fuel infrastructure, we can actually put workers and communities in charge of um, reinvesting and transitioning those spaces in a way that we wouldn't be able uh, to have otherwise. Um, so I think that uh, you know we can't leave this up, uh, up to chance. We can't leave it up to corporations that have um, wielded our government in all the wrong ways. We have to actually take it, um, take ownership over this. Um, I also want to talk about um, some of the examples we already see that are building the democratic economy right now and are building the, um, the on the values <laughs> that we see uh, portrayed in things like the Green New Deal. And these communities are um, building abundance and scarcity, right? They are, you know, scrapping it together with very little investment, you know, without the backing of so many people. Um, but what, what they're doing is um, using sustainability uh, as one of this, these groups that I'll talk about, Verde, um, says they're um, using sustainability as an anti-poverty strategy. And, um, you know, they're re-democratizing their spaces they're, and they're taking those spaces back. And those are the types of things that we should be investing in so that in this new renewable economy, in this new green economy, it's not one that is also, again, recaptured by the 1%. It's owned by us. So I just want to um, talk about those um, really incredible examples, and actually Valerie and I were talking about one uh, just a couple minutes ago in, um, in Highland Park, Michigan. Um, Highland Park, Michigan is a, a place that's actually inside of Detroit. It was the um, old Ford's um, company town. Yep. Um, Ford created Highland Park. Ford created Highland Park. Um, there's a long history that I'm sure uh, folks would be willing to, to give you there, but um, during the 2008-2009 crash that happened, um, the city defaulted on its energy bills to um, DTE, the investor-owned utility. And so one day, um, they just came and they took their um, they took their streetlights and put the city in darkness. Um, but what Solidarity did um, in, in coordination with Highland Park community members is they're actually implementing solar, so, uh, community-owned solar uh, lights. And while they're doing that, they're building political and community power in a really incredible way that's deeply rooted in justice and, and the people who are there. And, you know, again, they're working in scarcity. They're working against blackouts that are happening on a, on a you know, old, inefficient, bad grid that DTE hasn't invested in. Um, imagine if they had the funds, they had the ability to invest even more in that and build this, like, the, the vibrant community and build upon that vibrant community they've already created. So 
invest in the grid and community controlled and public uh, grid at that. Um, another example I'll give is Verde, who is a um, Latinx uh, community organizing group that is based in Portland, Oregon, working on green infrastructure and building um, cl uh, climate resilient communities. Portland has a lot of rain, right? Um, and their areas, there are barely any sidewalks really covered in concrete. In times of rain and the increasing amounts of rain we're getting, that's flooding places and putting lots of people at risk. Um, they're actually saying, no, we're going to rip up this concrete. We're going to create community gardens that also become thrive thriving centers for us to gather. And we're going to employ people from our community to do this work because economic and political enfranchisement um, are have a direct connection to um, climate vulnerability. And so recognizing that they're investing um, from a community-centered perspective um, in the, the green infrastructure of their area, as well as the affordable housing um, that's there. So they have this really um, intersectional, uh, intergenerational perspective on how we do this and how um, we create resilient communities. Um, the third one that I'll give is um, a group that's a, at the forefront of affordable housing and sustainability, which is Push Buffalo in Buffalo, New York, who are an amazing group of people who, um, you know, in this deindustrialized town are recognizing that they need affordable housing and they are going to be the ones to do it. Um, you know, the, and they have uh, been able to uh, take over vacant plots of land and recreate uh, and create and build affordable housing in those places. They, again, have been able to use that as a community organizing tool. They're bringing people into the fold to make decisions about their affordable housing together. Again, they're also working in these constraints of not enough funding, of not enough affordable housing, of uh, you know, gentrification happening in Buffalo. Imagine if we actually took the money that we're talking about, right, and we injected it into affordable housing and gave these types of groups even more agency and even more ability to build what they know that they already need and are doing. Um, so incredible, incredible groups that are doing things on the ground here in the United States that we could invest with this type of money. And before, I'm just gonna give one little plug. We've talked a lot about the United States here, um, but it's not just about the United States. Like we're, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, you know, defunding the military. We also need to recognize our climate debt as the United States. We need to stand in solidarity with the, um, you know, the these small island states that we are putting underwater right now, and you know we need to be paying that debt. Um, and also, we need to recognize like we can uh, help as peace building, um, building the solidarity economy, the democratic economy there, and also recognizing that those models that you know I've been talking about often are coming from those other places. And as the United States, with our militarism and with our um, imposition of our economic uh, paradigm, we have actually stripped some of that away. And so we have to pull you know, that influence out again. So uh, climate reparations are incredibly important to the conversations that we're having around defunding the military. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I get to go last, um, which is always fun, um, especially after these other great people. Um, I'm Lindsay Kashgarian, and I'm with the National Priorities Project, which is part of the Institute for Policy Studies. Um, and I spend all my time thinking about what we could do with the money if we cut the military budget. That's what I do all the time, every day, so let's hope I have some good ideas. Um, and, you know, while, while Valerie's out there facing down tanks, and while Leah's out there rallying hundreds of young people at the state capitol, and while you're talking to people who are building, no, building community solar so that they can run their own lights. Um, I'm probably neck deep in a spreadsheet, so that's, um, that's, that's what I do all the time. Um, Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, we've heard some about what we spend on the military, I'm going to talk some about um, what else we could do with that money and how we could get there. Um, so probably a lot of you, if you, if any of you know National Priorities Project, you probably know us for our pie chart, that thing that says that we spend 54% of the federal discretionary budget on the military. Um, but it's worse than that, as I think most of the people in this room know. 
um, we're not just spending more than half of our discretionary budget, which, you know, for those of you who are not, you know, for those of you who don't like math, uh, you know, more than half means that we're spending more on the military than we're spending on education, science, our many veterans programs, um, of the entire operation of the federal government, um, the, the IRS, we're spending more than we spend on um, public health, we're spending more than we spend on all of these things combined on our military. Uh, and it's not just that, we're spending now, we're on our way to $750 billion next year for just the military, um, but then you add on what we're spending to take care of the veterans who we have to take care of because we've sent them to war and we owe them that. We, you add on what we're spending on the Department of Homeland Security, which is billions more for a militarized border and immigration and deportations. Um, you add on, you can add on what we're spending on policing and mass incarceration, and that's billions more. So we're spending, you can get up, if you keep going like that, you definitely get up <coughs> to over a trillion dollars. Um, and just to, as some examples of how sick that is, um, for one thing, there's been a scandal recently on, despite having a $750 billion budget next year, the military has not invested enough in military housing, so that there's military housing with black mold and military housing with infestations of rodents and things like that. Um, which is relatively inexpensive, but something that they have not put enough money towards. Um, they're also spending hundreds of millions of dollars, which is a drop in the bucket when it comes to the Pentagon budget, but on military schools. And what's so bad about that is that they're b running schools in this country because they deem that the local public schools are too bad to send military children. And so they run a separate school for the military children and the local children in Mississippi or wherever, many of these schools are in the South, are going to the bad school, the two bad schools, and our federal government, instead of investing in those schools to make them better, is building a separate school. Um, and that, that continues, and that's, you know, it, ha it exists mostly in the Deep South and it's a legacy, obviously, of slavery and racism and all of those things um, that are still very much with us. Um, so that's a lot of where our money is going to. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about where the big, big dollars are going. Because even though military schools are a really egregious example of our priorities for a federal government, it's not huge money. Um, but where the huge money is, is in war, which we've already heard a lot about. Um, you know, we've spent, we're approaching $6 trillion now on our wars over the last almost 20 years. Um, and just for some context on that, there was a study that came out this summer um, that said that converting our electrical grid to completely renewable sources would cost just over $4 trillion. So if we'd invested 20 years ago in our electrical grid instead of and clean energy instead of these wars, we would be there by now. Um, so that's, that's the kind of thing that we have to make sure, we can't unspend that money, we can't go back and spend it differently, but we have to make sure that for the next 20 years we make a different decision. Um, there's also the fact that war leads to more war, right? We spent all this money on wars and we know that that's contributed to things like the rise of ISIS. There was an army study that came out that said that the only entity that had gotten ahead as a result of our wars in Iraq and Syria and all of those places, the only entity that got ahead as a result of all of that was Iran. And now, here we are on the brink of war with Iran. Um, so it's a, it's a never-ending loop. Our militarization of the world is a never-ending loop. Um, I was really heartened to see in the New York Times, I don't know if anybody saw this, an op-ed by a 17-year-old named Jamie Margolin, um, who is the founder of Zero Hour, which is a climate organization. And all of these organizations headed by 17-year-olds, like we all just need to get right behind them, right? Like that's 17-year-olds for the win. Um, but so I was reading it and it's about climate action and it was on the day of the climate strike and I was like, right on. 
And then she got to the, but we really need to get to the root causes of climate change, which is colonization. And when was the last time you read that in the New York Times? Um, so that was, that was pretty amazing. And I was like, well, maybe we're turning a corner here. Maybe, maybe this is really happening. Um, and then I was starting to hear Leah kind of make a reference to that too. Um, so so there, I think there's reason to hope. There's reason that all of these things go together. That's very much what the Poor People's Campaign is about. Um, they're not separate climate and militarism, racism and poverty, they're not separate. They're all related. So here's where we can cut money besides war. The United States has 800 military installations around the world. That is more than 90% of the world's foreign military installations are you the United States. And if that's not colonization, then please tell me what it is. We spend about $150 billion a year on those bases. And so we could easily save tens of billions of dollars by cutting just half of them, right? What if we had to make do with just 400 military installations instead of eight? How bad would that be? Um, we can spend, we can save a lot of money by cutting down on weapon systems that we don't need. Um, we've heard about <laughs> F-35, a lot of us know about that. Um, we could cut down on the aircraft carriers that we are planning to build, have 12 of when no other country has more than two. Well, what if we just cut down to like six? What if we only had three times as many as another country instead of six times as many? So if you start to add all of these things up, one of the things that, one of the pieces of work that I've done recently was with the Poor People's Campaign on the moral budget and identifying over $300 billion a year that we could cut from the Pentagon and military budget um, yes. By, yes. by doing some of those things. Now that's not easy to get done, right? If it were easy, we kind of have done it by now. Um, and there are some reasons why it's not so easy. And one of the biggest reasons, you know, we talk about lobbying, we talk about money and politics, those are really big problems. But the big problem that we probably don't talk about or focus on enough as much as we need to when it comes to cutting the military budget is the jobs. Um, I'm from Massachusetts, you know, that like super liberal progressive state where all of our representatives and senators are really pro-military spending because of the billions and billions of dollars that come into Massachusetts for all of the defense companies that we have there. Um, you know, there's a state board, a part of the state government of Massachusetts that's just pro-defense industry. That's what they do because it's the economy there and it's the economy so many places. And until we recognize that and how entrenched that part is, we're not gonna make a lot of progress here. Um, so there are some things that we can do about that. One is um, we think a lot about cutting the contractors and we need to do that desperately. Um, they're pulling in about half of the military budget. It's $350 billion a year. It's enormous uh, and, we, and that has to be a part of it. But we also actually need to cut the size of the military. We need to have fewer troops in fewer places around the world and that's where it comes to closing the bases and letting those people out of the military. And that's not as hard to do as it sounds like because there are already over 200,000 troops a year who leave military service. They just leave and all we have to do is just not replace them. And it gets smaller pretty fast. So that's one place where, where we could potentially make some progress if we built the political will to do it. That's still not easy. Um, so if we started to make some of those cuts, if we, if we figure out the jobs thing, um, and one way that we have to do it is by saying where the new jobs will come from, right? Um, and climate is a top contender for that, I would say. Um, I know there's a study that if we put just $200 billion toward climate, we could create almost 3 million jobs. Um, it's a huge job creator, and we need to make the case for why that would work. Um, one of the ways that we try to make this case at National Priorities Project is by making it local. So instead of these big numbers, 3 billion, 2, 3 million, 2.7 trillion, whatever, like who even knows what those are? Um, <coughs> Instead of just doing that, we work out 
like Valerie said for Michigan, the numbers of how much, are, how much are you paying for all of that spending? How much are Michigan taxpayers paying? How much are Massachusetts taxpayers paying? Um, and so it can be a really useful tool in writing an op-ed or lobbying your member of Congress, that I said lobbying, um, or any of those act actions that we all do that we try to change things to tell them not just, you know, here's the big picture, but here's what, here's what it is in your district. Here's what the taxpayers of your district are paying for nuclear weapons, and what if we reinvested that here? How many teachers could we hire? How many jobs in clean energy could we create? How many people could go on Medicaid for that amount of money? And we have a tool on our website. I, I think some of, someone mentioned it earlier and said they couldn't find it, but it's at nationalpriorities.org, and you can find those numbers for your state, your congressional district, your county, um, whatever, whatever they're good for. Um, and that's one way to make it kind of more real and more local. Because it is local. The jobs especially are local. Um, they're not something, jobs that exist somewhere out there. They're people in a place who need to pay their rent. Um, and this is where we really have to work on Democrats too, right? Because I, Massachusetts has an entirely Democrat congressional delegation, and all of them across the board have supported more higher military spending. The Democratic House added 12 F-35s over the official Pentagon request. They gave them more than what they asked for. We can't have that kind of politics on both sides and win. So there are a couple of things that gives me hope. Um, People over Pentagon is definitely one of them. Making this issue a part of the presidential campaign is enormous, and getting people to talk about it is enormous. Um, the Poor People's Campaign is, is the other big one. Uh, and I was there at the Poor People's Campaign Congress in June this year when they had a presidential forum. And nine presidential candidates came, um, including you know sort of most of the big ones. Um, and seven of them agreed that we need to cut the Pentagon budget. But we need to get, we need to hold them to that. It's one thing for them to say it there in that setting, in that room with those people. And it's another thing to get them to agree to specific things, which is what the people of our Pentagon campaign is working on. Um, so that's, that's really important. So I know that we're officially talking about hope later, so, um, so I'm gonna to try to save some hope for the next few minutes before we, before we close. Um, and just thank you all for, for being here and taking your Saturday to you know, think about depressing things. Okay, okay. Uh, can, we do, can we do a song real quick? Is that a thing we can do to get some hype? Okay, so if anyone, was at the Capitol yesterday, you probably know this. Can we all stand and then I'll teach it to you? Well, those who are able to stand, please. All right, so I'm not a singer, <laughs> but like, that just means low standard for you guys too. <laughs> so um, I'll do the first two lines and then you guys repeat and then I'll do the last two lines and repeat and then we'll do it together, okay? All right, so it goes. People gonna rise like the water, gonna calm this crisis down. People gonna rise like the water, gonna calm this crisis down. Can hear the voice of my great granddaughter saying climate justice now. I can hear the voice of my great granddaughter saying climate justice now. All right, now can we do it together? Yeah. Ready? All right. Yeah. <laughs> Got this. Ready. People gonna rise like the water, gonna calm this crisis down. Can hear the voice of my great granddaughter saying climate justice now.
Batteries work. Oh, the batteries are working. Okay, wait. Question number one coming up right here. Who's number two? You directed to one or more of the individuals that you would like them to answer. I'm just curious, which two candidates did not agree with the senators? <laughs> I have to cross them off. My you list. had to ask that, didn't you? Um, all right. So one of them I'm going to say doesn't count because he has said it numerous other times in other settings. We somehow we didn't get. Bernie to say that he was going to cut the Pentagon budget, um, and the other one, it was it was sort of like it was a multi-part question, but she didn't get to this part. Was Kamala Harris? Um, so, but all of them, who by the way, the people over Pentagon campaign is speaking with on Friday of next week. Um, so, but all of these people need to get on the record. Um, I think, that as far as I know, the only one. Who has a um, who has a actual number attached to how much he would cut Pentagon spending is Andrew Yang, and it's only sixty billion dollars. Um, so these people need to get on the record, and they need to come up with a big number, a good number. Um, and I and also say, you know, two hundred billion is a great number. I'm all for two hundred billion. Um, I'm all for three hundred billion. I'm all for one hundred billion. Please cut it. Um, and I will also say that the, the Poor People's Campaign did invite all of the candidates, including the current president, who for some reason didn't show up. 